Kia ora. Welcome to Women in Data Science Auckland 2020. This year, we're sharing a series of talks from women sharing their career contributions across many industries. WITS Auckland is an independent event organised by the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering to coincide with the annual Global Women in Data Science Conference. I'm Kate Colich, WITS Ambassador, and I'm delighted to be here to help share these inspiring stories. Today's speaker is Shraddha Patel. Shraddha is a data science consultant at Servian, who are silver sponsors of Women in Data Science Auckland. Shraddha is passionate about solving business problems using data, technology, and processes. In her free time, she loves to put her skills to practice through data science talks and datathons. In this talk, she shares how participating in datathons and hackathons have enabled her to bring her skills to the community. Yep. Cool. Hi, I'm Shraddha, um, and I'm thrilled to be presenting today at Women in Data Science. This is actually my first time presenting to such a big global community, and I'm extremely grateful to Kate and Rosalind for uh, helping me organize this and just helping me throughout the process and for Sylvian Enterprise ID, especially Devin, Tanya, and my co-presenter today, Amanda, for this wonderful opportunity. Now, the topic of discussion today is localized models for social good. But before going into the technical details, I would like to introduce myself. So I come from this uh, city called Ahmedabad in Western India. It has a population of 5 million and growing. It is almost the size of New Zealand, um, but it is little known outside India. It is famous for its food, song, and dance. <laughs> I spent all my childhood and some years in uni in and around the city. Talking about university, I took my bachelor's in IT, and oh boy, I've never felt so out of place than those long four years. To give you some context, only one um, in six students in the course were women. And over the years, more and more women are dropping out from a technical career. I wasn't bad technically. In fact, I love to code. Just that I constantly felt, felt like fish out of water because it always seemed like almost everybody else knew more than me. And so why would anybody hire me? Why would anybody need me? I also felt extremely crippled thinking that everyone was just trying to solve complex algorithmic problems and I enjoyed solving social problems instead. Naturally, something had to change and I think data, and I think at the time I thought the data would give me that opportunity. So in 2016, I made my big move to Adelaide in Australia and started a master's degree in data analytics. Here I found my past fears coming true all over again. I wasn't in love with the maths behind the algorithms. I did not find my salvation in, in getting the highest accuracy through a custom complex neural network. But there were a few things that did make me stick. One among them, Servian, the company that I've been working for for the last one and a half years. Servian started some 12 years ago as a data consultancy in Sydney. Over time, it has grown to over 500 employees um, and spans across 10 different locations in four countries. And now we have over 100 customers. Servian acquired Enterprise ID, a managed services uh, provider in 2019. This really complements Servian's growing consultant, consulting base. Servian is also a silver sponsor for, for women in data science. So what exactly do we do at Servian? Uh, Servian services span across five different pillars, data, AI, digital, customer, uh, engagement, and cloud. And other services include DevOps and cybersecurity. Servian does advisory, consulting, as well as managed services. Now coming back to my gen general boredom and distaste to specializing, Servian gave me that opportunity to be able to use my problem solving skills across many different domains. We start with a problem and then find the right resources and the tech to solve it. 
Coming back to the other reason why I, I did stick in data analytics. Like the comic on the left suggests, data problems can be like trying to look for sunken treasures. There's no set manual, there is no maps, there are no guaranteed timelines, and you might not even get any results post going the rabbit hole. While this can be extremely frustrating and quite challenging, I also found it extremely rewarding. A little tip for anybody who's starting in the data analytics field, try data thons. University and a few Kaggle competitions will set you up theoretically in the field of data analytics. But real progress happens when you leave the comfort of clean, pretty looking data and dabble with some real dirty data. The first ever that datathon that I participated in was in 2017. It was called GoHack. Uh, we were dealing with government and some open source data sets. It made me realize that I don't really need to start with maths. I could start with the problem and then figure out the maths to solve it. So in March this year, I decided to mentor for the Datathon for Social Good. It was organized by these wonderful organizations called Community Hubs Australia and our community. The problem statements, if, if solved, would create some real social impact. And so I decided to do some of my own analysis on the side. And today I want to, want to walk you through that analysis and all the lateral skills that I've picked up over the years. So the first step in the process, always start with knowing the organization. For the Datathon, we were trying to find some data related solutions for Community Hubs Australia. It is a not-for-profit targeting women, especially migrant um, and refugee young mothers, and provide them with support, educational, communication, health, etc. The organization creates this community to prevent isolation of young mothers from the Australian society. What moved me the most about this organization was that in some situations, they also provide help in, against domestic violence. The sessions, they are run in designated schools called hubs, um, which are also the primary unit of impact. And they are run with the help of school authorities. Next, coming to the problem statement. Australia has about 10,000 different schools. How would community hubs decide which are the schools, schools to open the hubs in that would maximize the impact? I can, again, like, is there, is there a smart solution to this problem? Can the data be used? I also had to learn the technical know-how of the organization and how will the solution be used? I concluded that the solution had to be extremely simple. For instance, just an Excel file tracking all the schools from top to bottom, which are the highest potential of, of becoming a hub. The process needs to be automated and repeatable so that year after year after year, they can use the same process to, to start hubs in more schools. Now talking about the solution, what is lookalike modeling? Assume that you are the director or say the head of head of marketing in this um, in a clothing brand with a specific customer demographic, 18 to 32 um, a German fe German females who love online shopping. Your board, your boss decides to expand in the French market and has tasked you with running some marketing campaigns for the launch. Now you can create a data model which identifies potential characteristics of the French customers, which, which are also exhibited by your German customer base. Or in other words, identify lookalikes. We'll do something similar for ranking schools. We'll try and find schools which look similar to our current hubs. Next, let's look at what characteristics go in measuring the similarity. First, start with the right data. This is easier said than done, but some starting with the right data is absolutely crucial to this process. So we started with using the current hubs, the school, the school names at the locations where all the community hubs sessions were run. Next, we also looked at some public data sets and credit to our community for really cleaning up and providing some, some good hubs data as well as the links to FIDU and ACRA data sets. 
ACRA or Australian Curriculum uh, Assessment and Re Reporting Authority provides this very informative data set about schools. Their names, their location, enrollment numbers, staff numbers, um, as well as the students' backgrounds. So language, do they belong to indigenous tribes? Uh, what is their socioeconomic background? The other data set that I used was the FIDU Social Health Atlas. It, is a, it contains demographic and social indicators on, on almost everything. So think about census, think about health, think about um, tracking financial stresses across different suburbs. FIDU, has, FIDU will have information on something. So because it is such a comprehensive data set, like identifying the right, uh, right data sets to use was a very difficult task. I did narrow it down to a few, um, which I'll just describe now. The first one that we uh, that I used was migrant statistics and workplace information. The rationale was to identify women or locations who have uh, young migrant mothers. The second was early childhood development and uh, language background, which can indicate women who might have some communication issues or whose children are vulnerable. And finally, some income support and childcare child care support data sets. There might be some young stay-at-home mothers who might be looking after young children and the elderly. They, they might have some real limited opportunities and might feel extremely isolated. So I thought that this, might, this, this process might really help them. Next, feature engineering. What is it? We always need to clean our data before we put them in the models. Real data doesn't come in the format that we need it to be. This process is called feature engineering. And over the years, I think I've learned that intuitive feature engineering is extremely important. It is a very creative process. There isn't a set manual in any way. And in some ways, I find that it is much more important than the model or the algorithm themselves. For instance, some features improve not just the performance of the model, but also help in explaining the model better and the eventual usability of the results. I modified the current features in such a way that they would align with the strategic objectives and the business related constraints of community hubs. So let's look at a few examples. The first one uh, was cleaning up the school names. So for instance, removing words like um, primary or the suburb names. Rational was, uh, rational was that if St. John's primary is already a part of the hubs network, then St. John's secondary could be convinced to become one. The second type of uh, feature engineering that I did was splitting the start and the end years of the schools into two different, uh, into two distinct features. We're targeting young mothers. And so like the start and the end uh, year of the schools might be extremely relevant. And finally, the enrollment to staff ratios. And the rationale behind this was that the hubs are run in support or through school staff and volunteers. If the enrollment to staff ratio is extremely high, it will be really, it will be really hard to find enough motivation or resources in the school to support such initiatives. Now, let's talk about the actual modeling. Use maths to fit the problem not the other way around. I like to repeat that. Fit, use maths to fit the problem, not the other way around. Define your objective and the method to do it. So what is the objective here? Rank schools such that if they were included in, um, along, with, along with the current hubs, the current hubs would always end up at the top. And the method to do this, Calculate the similarity between the current hubs and all the schools, sum it for each school and then rank. Now let's talk about similarity a little bit. There are many standard similarity uh, metrics um, or methods such as Checkard, Cosine, Manhattan distance, et cetera. But I used COA specifically because I needed to cater for some uh, categorical features like school names and suburbs. Core similarity gives us that kind of flexibility to use categorical and numerical features in the same model. Essentially, all it does is it looks at the feature, measures the similarity, um, and then averages across all the features to get a similarity between the school and the hub. 
And then we sum up that similarity across all the hubs with a single school to get an overall generalized similarity score. We use that similarity score then to just rank all the schools. Uh, this method would ideally rank schools that look like the current hubs at the top. Also note that I do not use any k-means or you know, any fancier algorithms. Again, remember to use the maths to fit the problem. If the problem has a simple solution, do not try and make it complex just for the sake of it. Um, a little bit about the modeling process. Every data science model of any sorts needs some kind of measurement. It needs to be some kind of metric that we can measure different models against and gives us some idea about the performance. Simply, I used, um, I used recall as, as a metric to do it. Simply put, if we rank all the schools, including the current hubs, what proportion of the current hubs turn up at the top? For simplicity, there are about 70 current hubs, if we cut the rank, uh, if we cut the list at the top 100, how many of those 70 hubs would you see in the top 100 list? That is how I defined a call. Now let's digress and talk about feature selection. Why do some base similarity metrics need any kind of feature selection? Why can't we use all the features as is? Now, if you remember, Goa uses equal weights across all the different features. This means that even if the feature is, is unimportant, it would still take it, take it into consideration and use that bit in, this, in the similarity calculation. But not all features are relevant. We just don't know which ones. Uh, some might be irrelevant, some might be worse. They might actually decrease, deteriorate or decrease the performance of the model. So how do we determine which features are the best to use? First, we just do a, a feature ranking with the help of uh, these two models called uh, date of evidence and information value. Essentially for every categorical or for numerical features, we would just divide them into, into, into 10 bins. And for every possible value or every possible um, bin, we just calculate the percentage of hubs versus schools which are not hubs. And then we sum it across all the bins and use that metric to rank all the features. Once we have the ranked list of the features, we take one feature at a time, use that to calculate similarity, calculate the top 100 recall. If the recall has increased, we select that feature. If the recall hasn't increased, then we keep on going. And with this over time, like by testing all the features, we'll be able to come up with a, a very small list of features, which really help in improving and increasing the recall and we'll have the we'll have the best model over time. Finally, I'd like to talk about uh, probably the most important part of this data analytics process. It's called storytelling. If you're not convinced that this is very important, think about these two statements. Because we are testing more we're finding more COVID cases. If we were to stop testing now, there'd be very few cases. While it is morally incorrect to say this, semantically, there is nothing wrong with the statement. Case in point, you can use the same data to create and communicate just about any narrative. Storytelling, it is a double-edged sword. It is extremely powerful, but just as dangerous. With this in mind, using all the process that I've described before, I created two different models. One with location and school name features and one without. The recall on the first model is about 65% and on the second one is about 30%. Naively, you'd like to think that the first model would perform better, but I'll convince you that the second one is much more actionable. For instance, the first one uses location-specific features like the suburb, the school names, and children in uh, children uh, who are vulnerable in communication domain. This brings up a lot of schools in the vicinity of the current hubs. If we were to start establishing hubs using this model, all we will do is just increase the concentration of hubs in some specific suburbs. It doesn't necessarily reach more women or increase the impact. 
The second model, on the other hand, can help community hubs venture into new suburbs with some more useful information. For instance, more migrants, uh, families with, uh, with other language backgrounds, so languages other than English, jobless families, uh, you know, pension card holders. To sum up, I feel that a job as a data scientist does not end at creating a model. Explainability, actionability, and ensuring that the model is fair and free of bias is your job too. Finally, on a slightly more somber note, I'd like to talk about imposter syndrome. In spite of being extremely thorough in my analysis and having worked in this field for over two and a half years now, I thought that this analysis was not good enough. I grappled with the idea of publishing it. And for 15 days, I just kept on going backwards and forwards, you know, just checking the spelling mistakes, rechecking everything, checking it all over again. And that cycle kept on going on for a while. I really wanted to make it perfect. I mean, I could not put my analysis out in the world. What will others think? What if they think that it's no good? What if they just thought that I was no good? What if my credibility was, was severely damaged and nobody wanted to hire me as a data scientist anymore? If these thoughts sound familiar, please know that there is a way out. I learned this new trick. Hit publish before you think you're ready. Like Sheryl Sandberg, the Facebook CEO says, done is better than perfect. Next one, ask for help. Create a group of mentors, especially at work, who give you feedback, unaltered advice, who are your cheerleaders. I myself have been extremely lucky to have created this group of mentors. I call them my circle of confidence at Servian and other clients that I've worked. If you're listening to this, I thank you, Peter, Lindy, Alex, Graham, and so many others who've been helping me through my journey. And for those of you who are already leaders or who are going to be future leaders, please push and show women how to create the circle of confidence and reach out for help when they need it. On that note, I'd like to hand it over to Amanda, my co-presenter today. Thank you, Shrada. That was um, always fascinating to hear um, you dissect maths into information. I found that really interesting, thank you. My name's Amanda Watson, everyone, and I'm the Business Account Manager in New Zealand for EIT um, Servian. And we're affili affiliated with Tech Women New Zealand, just as Servian is a sponsor as well of um, WITS, a silver sponsor. So just picking up on Shrada's point around um, imposter syndrome, which is something that I think many women or people can feel as they start to work through their career. Um, this is something that we talk a lot about in Tech Women New Zealand, uh, in, in specifically for this piece and for um, Tech Week with regard to women applying for roles in IT as well as all sectors, but for us specifically for IT. So um, there has been a survey run by LinkedIn um, and uh, they actually have some statistics around this. Um, so in this uh, so in this slide we can see what what do the statistics say um, there there's a lot of information if you care to read through the very interesting um, LinkedIn survey that they did um, basically women are more selective or hesitant when applying for a job um, that they see advertised the job description or when applying for a promotion for many factors um, and in fact this is quite a, a large it's a broad subject but in specifics it's because they want to be really, really sure that they have the correct aligned skill set. And that's something we carry with us through our careers. Um, it appears that men are more likely to apply if they feel they have maybe 60% um, of the skill set. Whereas for some reason, we women um, maybe second guess ourselves or want to be really sure, whatever the reason, we are more hesitant. Um, so, just to wrap up this particular section, um, the just remember um, how awesome you are. Um, 
essentially for most of us when applying for a new role or if we've returned to the workplace or if we're considering a promotion and we're considering the balance of work and family etc um, we look at this job description and many job adverts have tick boxes and check boxes um, so what we would like to I would like to encourage people to do women in technology as you go through your career is think outside the box which is quite an old saying but it's it's true in this fact um, go beyond the tick boxes and remember what you have to offer whether you're entering moving or transitioning within the career um, celebrate your natural talents and bring them to the table because what you bring is something that's not in a job description and remember that when you sit opposite people and, and have your interview or discussion, and also with your mentors, as Shrada said, it's very important. So um, that's my small piece about female talent and, and IT, which you're obviously all progressing through. Um, we have a few slides uh, that we'll run through quite quickly um, uh, with regard to the Serbian um, AI offerings. Um, you're welcome to look at this slide in leisure. Um, also with regard to the next slide, which is about um, our other service domains, um, which we have uh, data, digital, customer cloud, etc. Some of our um, customers, um, oh, contact us of course first of all myself Shrada and Devon who um, uh, brought this together initially uh, so as you can see we have quite a few quite a few offices and locations information there is for you if you need us at all and then a couple of our customers well quite a few of our customers lots of bright logos there across Australia and New Zealand and some of the technology companies that we work with that we partner with which are essential to the success in our business and conversations with our customers across all sorts of um, areas uh, of business corporate um, government health security um, ambulance fire all sorts of things these are the technology partners that help us understand how to deliver that um, so with no further ado, I would like to say thank you very much for joining and for listening. And it's been our privilege to present this for you. Thank you very much.